This is the bonus chapter of uh, the Spreadcharts app tutorial and I will show you my workflow. What combinations of data and charts I personally use to analyze the markets, the specific commodities uh, or commodity groups. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to be inspired by my setup, but uh, ultimately it's up to you uh, and uh, your approach to the markets. And I will also show you uh, my weekly routine, how I look for uh, opportunities, new opportunities in the markets. So let's start with uh, the second part, with uh, the opportunities. I usually look for new opportunities uh, once a week uh, during the weekend, uh, usually on Saturday. And uh, the reason is that uh, uh, we are focused, uh, not just uh, ourselves, but even our software, uh, Spreadcharts app, is focused on medium to longer term opportunities. So it's uh, totally unnecessary to scan the market uh, every day. Of course, if you are in a position on some commodity or are looking for an entrance into um, the opportunity you already analyzed, then it makes uh, great sense to uh, watch that uh, particular market uh, every day. But for the general overview of the situation on the markets and uh, identification of new opportunities, I would say the weekly fre frequency is uh, sufficient. And I start my weekly routine uh, with uh, the trading signals. Of course, uh, once the new signals are generated by our artificial intelligence on uh, Saturday. Remember that uh, we always uh, let you know on our Twitter when the new signals are added to the app. And uh, the signals are really helpful to me because they save me incredible amount of time. I do not have to go through the markets one by one and analyze it uh, uh, in detail because our model, our machine learning model, just do that for me. So I can browse the opportunities uh, uh, it uh, identified and just take a closer look at those that uh, catch my eye. I already uh, explained the signals in another chapter of uh, this tutorial, so I will not delve into this uh, right now. But there is one thing I have not mentioned yet. I do not uh, examine the signals uh, just on the uh, individual basis, but I also look at uh, the output from the model as a whole. What does it mean? Well, for example, uh, let's say that uh, I can see there is a short signal on the longer dated uh, US uh, Treasury bonds. And keep in mind that uh, the machine learning model uh, may be not as successful on financial future futures simply because the input data is uh, not as uh, relevant for these markets. Uh, they are tailored for physical commodities. But nevertheless, uh, the model has been working uh, really good uh, on this market, on bonds, uh, recently. Uh, there was a strong uh, buy, uh, long signal uh, here in uh, the middle of May that just uh, nailed the bottom on this market and uh, there uh, has been a nice rally and suddenly the model flipped from long to short. Of course the signal is not yet valid but uh, this sudden change in the signal's direction is definitely uh, worth my attention. But uh, it doesn't end here because I also see that uh, there are short signals on gold and silver. Uh, these uh, have been in the app for uh, some time uh, already, but uh, the overall picture uh, tells me that maybe uh, the rates will go up uh, that will put uh, precious metals under pressure and of course uh, that would also fit the uh, bearish signal on the treasury bonds. 
Moreover, uh, there is a short signal on Brent crude oil, which uh, coupled uh, with uh, the short signals on precious metals, uh, tell me that uh, maybe uh, the dollar will go up and the commodities can get under pressure. Of course, keep in mind that uh, the performance of the model is also not as good on crude oil as on other commodities because this market is under heavy geopolitical influence. Uh, anytime someone from OPEC or you know Russia can release some statement that will move the market or decide to limit production or increase production. So that's the risk on crude oil. But uh, if I connect the dots and uh, take a look at uh, uh, the output from the model. Uh, this is the message uh, I see uh, right now. But there is more. Uh, I can see there is a long signal on soybean meal and also soybean oil. So that means uh, soybean complex uh, might outperform in uh, the near future. And I also watch uh, the spreads because uh, they can uh, tell us a lot about even about the underlying markets. Although they look like a directionless strategy because you are always long and short on the same commodity they have a directional bias because uh, they can be either bull spreads or bear spreads. It depends uh, whether you uh, buy the uh, near contract and sell the more distant contract. That's a bull spread. Bull spreads usually rise together with uh, the underlying commodity. An example of a bull spread is uh, here, uh, the bull spread on cattle. Or you can have better spreads uh, like uh, mm, the spread on a brand crude oil where you buy the more distant contract, which is always the contract with uh, the uh, plus sign or uh, at least without the negative sign and short the near contract, uh, which is always the contract with the minus sign. And in this case, it's uh, February. So this is a typical example of uh, a bear spread. And bear spreads usually go down when the underlying goes up. Uh, this relationship uh, does not hold uh, 100% of the time, but most of the time it just works that way. And that's exactly why these spreads, these signals on interdelivery spreads uh, can be helpful even if you do not trade them and uh, focus just on the underlying commodity because uh, they can tell you even something about the direction of uh, those commodity, com commodities. For example, if there are uh, bull spreads on grains, uh, maybe there is a slightly bullish uh, bias uh, on these grains, especially when there is a uh, bullish uh, or long signal on the underlying commodity. So if I see... Uh, uh, a bull spread on a particular commodity together with uh, a, a long signal, that's uh, the best possible combination for bullish uh, strategies. But this is just an example. Uh, keep in mind that the signals uh, work on a probabilistic basis. They show you just some increased likelihood of some something happening, definitely not a guarantee and that's how the markets themselves uh, work uh, you can never be sure about the direction of uh, any market but still the signals can be very helpful and most uh, importantly they will save you a lot of time and uh, once I'm done with the first look at uh, the output from the model in general I go through individual signals and if something uh, catch my eye, I will just uh, expand the signal and take a closer look and maybe open uh, the signal under charts, uh, analyze it, uh, take a look at other data, cross market analysis and so on. So uh, that's how I start my week or my weekend with uh, the signals. But I do not look just at the signals. Uh, I have many charts uh, prepared in my watch list and I go through some of them every weekend. 
Of course, uh, I like some groups of uh, commodities uh, more than the others. Uh, that's, by the way, uh, the reason why I have many charts for the energy markets, but uh, not so many of them for soft commodities, uh, for example. And I rely more on the signals for, us, uh, for the soft uh, commodities. But I would say that uh, understandable and uh, every one of us is biased one way or the other. So right now I will show you my workflow. What combinations of data and charts I go through every week for the major groups of commodities like the energy. So let's start with uh, the energy markets and uh, the crude oil specifically. I can divide uh, my charts or the records in my watch list into the short term, medium term or longer term analyses. Uh, you can see the spreads uh, which are important part of my workflow. These are rather um, short term charts. They are very important for short term uh, predictions and uh, commitments of traders data that is uh, a medium term indicator. So let's take a look at uh, those charts for now. I will not uh, show you the price charts because they are obvious. Uh, there would be no nothing surprising about them. So these are the spreads and I use uh, this setup. You have uh, probably noticed that these are the spreads on Brent crude oil. Uh, both are bull spreads. Uh, the top subchart is the spread uh, on the near end of the curve. It's usually the spread between the first and second uh, contracts. Uh, so that gives me uh, the idea about the changes uh, on the near end of uh, the turn structure. While the bottom subchart is the spread from the back end or the more distant part of uh, the term structure curve. I usually use uh, a wider spread. Uh, this one has uh, three months or is, is three months wide because the differences between the more distant contracts are usually uh, not as significant as uh, between the contracts at the near end of the curve. The blue or red curves are the spreads and the purple curves uh, are the underlying futures. And I usually look for divergences between the spreads and the underlying. I can see one such divergence here uh, on the top subchart because uh, uh, the underlying is just consolidating, moving sideways. But the spread has already broken higher and made a lower low. Uh, the more distant spread is still holding but uh, this is the first warning that maybe there will be some weakness on crude oil uh, and i continue with uh, my analysis uh, i uh, switch to the spreads on wti and i can clearly see that this market is weaker than the brand the divergence on the first spread is uh, much more significant and uh, the uh, distant spread is already breaking higher uh, unlike on unlike the spread on brand futures that is still holding or above the previous local low so that's the information i can get from these spreads it is uh, especially valuable for short-term predictions. And I also have uh, the spreads for some products like uh, Arbop gasoline in the US or diesel in Europe. Um, it works uh, the same. And now let's take a look at the commitments of traders data on crude oil. As I said, uh, this is more of a medium term indicator and it's not a timing indicator. It cannot uh, tell you uh, to go long or, or short, it can just tell you whether the market is overbought and oversold. And this information, in my uh, opinion, is very valuable for the risk management because uh, it is true that uh, over overbought markets can become uh, even more overbought and uh, vice versa. But the point is uh, that when you see uh, such an overbought market, uh, you probably won't be building a huge long position because it doesn't make sense from the risk reward perspective. 
I am uh, saying this because sometimes people complain that uh, the commitments of tra- traders data uh, doesn't work, that uh, it failed and so on. But it's just about the correct interpretation and use of the data. So this is very important. I use this setup for the COT data on crude oil. Uh, I do not look at the hedgers as much on uh, this market because, uh, first of all, uh, there is an exception on WTI crude oil where we don't use the producers, uh, processors, users, and so on group, but we use the swap dealers. Uh, The reason for this exception is that uh, the... In our opinion, the hedging activity uh, on this market is uh, more concentrated uh, through the swaps rather than uh, through the group of uh, the producers and so on. But uh, that's not as critical. Uh, The point is that uh, the large speculators that manage money are more reliable for measuring the the overbought or oversold conditions on on crude oil and of course i watch the data both uh, for brand and wti crude oil but uh, usually the brand is the more important contract it's a global benchmark for crude oil Uh, you can sometimes hear that it's uh, crude oil from the north sea that's true but uh, many uh, parties around the world are using it as a benchmark to price their production their contracts and so on I think the correlation with the price is obvious Uh, when the curves are too high then the market is overbought when they are uh, rather low then the market is uh, oversold and of course I use the cut index the COT index because that way I can compare uh, the readings across commodities like in this case so it's very helpful And uh, it's also a much better choice for longer term analysis, especially if you are uh, comparing the readings uh, across uh, many years. So, uh, but that's my personal preference. So that was the commitments of traders data. I have some other charts uh, I want to show you, but these are more useful for longer term analysis. So maybe I do not open them every week but still they are very uh, helpful this is the contango analysis uh, on crude oil brand crude oil uh, specifically and i use uh, this combination of charts the uh, histogram on the top and by the way i picked this combination of contracts it's uh, the continuous contango because it's uh, the contango contango between the seventh and fourth contract on brand crude oil uh, the reason why i do not uh, pick the first and second contract is that the volatility is really huge uh, on the near end of the curve and this is much more smooth and uh, the chart looks uh, much better and also it discounts uh, the longer term longer term situation maybe slightly better than uh, the contango on the near end of the curve uh, the middle chart shows the same as you see uh, the same quantity you see on the top sub chart it's the continuous contango between those uh, two uh, contracts and I also have uh, the price of the underlying below just for indicative purposes, but I mostly watch uh, these two uh, charts. The Contango chart is helpful in many ways. First of all, I can use the histogram to immediately see whether the current uh, Contango reading is uh, rather low or, or high. For example, uh, if we get to the left green area, I can say that uh, the current contango is uh, slightly lower compared to the historical norm. And uh, if we get uh, to the uh, right green area, we can say that uh, the contango is elevated. Uh, however, it gets interesting when we get outside of the green colored range, which means that uh, we uh, get above the 95th percentile, which is a contango spike. Uh, and that is usually associated with a durable bottom, 
on crude oil. You can see it here, the Contango spike uh, in 2020 was clearly associated with the sell-off and the bottom on uh, crude oil and the bull market uh, then followed. But you can find other instances like here in 2015 or even here in 2008 and uh, many times before like 1998 and so on. So this is very useful uh, metric uh, to follow. On the other hand, if we get uh, well into the negative area below the fifth percentile, that is a backwardation spike, uh, which means that contango is negative. And such cases were historically associated with important uh, price tops. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, they have not been as uh, reliable as the contango spikes because uh, the backwardation spikes uh, were not sharp, but usually followed by you know some consolidation in the backwardation and uh, the market turned somewhat turned lower somewhat later in any case uh, this is a critical chart for the energy traders uh, the contango on crude oil the market structure is uh, crucial and i have the same chart also for the wti crude oil it looks uh, very similar and uh, the principles uh, are the same so maybe I will skip the explanation here. Uh, I picked uh, the same combi combination of contracts uh, so that I can get rid of the uh, noise and uh, the volatility or on the near end of the curve. But uh, this one gets interesting. It's uh, the crack spread in the US, which is uh, important uh, fundamental indicator. Uh, it's a measure of the refinery margins in the US. I have uh, three subcharts here. The top subchart is the histogram, once again. Uh, the middle subchart is uh, the crack spread itself, I mean, the price of the crack spread itself. And below is the price of uh, WTI crude oil, the first continuous contract uh, connected by uh, or rolled by maximum open interest. So uh, when the spread gets too high, uh, that's a sign that uh, the margins are strong, which means that uh, there is a strong demand for crude oil. However, that's usually associated, when we reach an extreme, that's usually associated with intermediate market top. As you saw, for example, here in 2018 and even here in 2019. Uh, I can zoom out even further so you can take a look yourself. Uh, when the uh, margins are too low, on the other hand, that means uh, the situation is not sustainable and uh, some kind of uh, mean reversal will probably follow. So this is also an uh, important piece of data. I often share this chart on our Twitter and you can follow it yourself uh, in the app. So I think that's all for crude oil. I can go through some other charts, but uh, I don't want the video to be too long. So let's move to the natural gas. I will select uh, these few charts and uh, let's take a look at them, maybe also this one. So <clears throat> the most important chart I usually follow on NetGas is this one, it's the term structure chart. It is uh, much more relevant to me than a simple price chart, simply because the term structure is uh, very rippled uh, on net gas, which means there are huge differences between individual contracts. Uh, the winter contracts are much more expensive than uh, the off-season expirations or even the summer uh, expirations. Therefore, watching the price of a single contract or a continuous contract would uh, provide only uh, incomplete information about the market. So, uh, term structure is a much better choice for analyzing the movements in the net gas market.
When uh, I open this chart every week, uh, I start with uh, comparing the situation exactly with uh, a week ago. It makes sense. Uh, therefore, I can see whether uh, the price uh, moved up or down across the curve. So not just the first contract, but uh, the winter season, off season or um, whatever uh, part of the curve I wish to analyze. And I can also uh, compare the current uh, price, the current curve with uh, the historical average or average curves like the 5-year average, 15-year average or the 30-year average. And I can also analyze uh, or compare uh, the shape or the slope of the curves, especially between the current curve and the 15-year or 5-year curves, because uh, it can also uh, provide me um, important information about uh, the spread behavior and uh, potential uh, opportunities uh, among the spreads. So this chart is uh, extremely valuable for net gas traders. And I'll also follow the individual spreads, uh, like you can see on this chart that you are already familiar with. Uh, I pick the nearest uh, spread on the top and some more distant and also wider spread combination on the bottom subchart. Uh, it provides me a similar uh, information to the development of uh, the turn structure curve, but it is better for analyzing the development of the spreads over time because I can get this information also from uh, these three uh, options here, but still uh, these are just uh, three curves and I can follow the entire history using uh, the specific spreads. So uh, I already described this chart on crude oil, so the use case is basically the same. The commitments of traders' data is an uh, important part of my uh, analytical process, uh, even on NADGAS. I tend to follow both the hedgers and the speculators here. Um, I usually uh, pick the caught position index, but I can uh, delve into other caught products if I'm doing a more detailed analysis. For, but for the quick uh, overview, uh, this is... Uh, quite sufficient. So commitments of traders data on NADGAS is very useful and I recommend you to watch it carefully. I also tend to perform uh, seasonality analysis. Uh, this time is uh, critical to select a specific contract you are interested in analyzing or trading because there can be really uh, large differences uh, in seasonal behavior across uh, the curve on the net gas, which is obvious when you uh, when you see the curve. So right here, I have uh, the seasonal analysis for the December contract, which is the first contract in the in the heating season. And I use the typical combination of uh, the seasonal curves and the statistics uh, on the bottom. I hide the five-year statistics because it's uh, not enough data for uh, or to make a meaningful conclusion. But uh, otherwise, uh, the use case is the same as uh, on crude oil or any other commodity. And I will jump to the last uh, tab because uh, it is uh, unique to the NetGas market. Here I do not uh, tend to follow just the random spreads as I do on other commodities, but uh, I'm also focused on this particular spread combination because this is the famous Widowmaker spread. It is called that way due to the fact that uh, these contracts are across uh, or th this combination of contracts uh, is made from the March contract which is uh, the last contract in the heating season and the April contract which is the first contract in the off season and as I told you uh, there are huge price differences between the uh, off season and the heating season and also these uh, contracts uh, can behave uh, wildly differently and that means this spread can be extremely volatile and that's the reason for the name because the volatility can virtually kill you. 
But uh, the reason I follow this spread is uh, purely analytical because it serves as a great benchmark for the expected uh, demand uh, in the next heating season. And so I watch the continuous price of uh, the spread, uh, whether it's strong or weak. And I also uh, take a look at the valuation. For example, here you can see that in the very short term or even the medium term, uh, the spread is uh, overvalued. So I wouldn't be surprised by a uh, mean reversion, at least in the short term. That would also affect the underlying uh, net gas market in a way that uh, even the net gas market itself uh, can correct in the near term. And finally, I have the continuous uh, contango chart over here. Uh, once again, this is a long term or chart for long term analysis, so I do not open it every week. And I have to say, I do not uh, watch it as much uh, here as on other commodities. And the reason is, once again, the rippled uh, term structure on net gas, which means that uh, uh, these continuous contracts uh, are basically made out of all the contracts across the uh, term structure curve. And this can be really distorting on net gas uh, because uh, there are huge differences between uh, the winter season, the off season and so on. And uh, aggregating this, uh, this data into continuous contracts uh, can really distort the reality and the resulting analysis. And that's the reason why I mostly uh, use this chart just to look for the contango or backwardation spikes. Uh, that can be useful for identification of uh, major turnarounds in the net gas market. But now let's move to another group of uh, commodities and uh, these will be grains. Grains are the most liquid uh, agricultural commodities and it's also the reason why they are very popular among the spread traders because even the distant contracts are very liquid in grains. Not as much liquid as uh, in the energy markets but compared to other uh, agricultural commodities like meat it's definitely liquid enough to trade in reasonable uh, quantities. These markets also exhibit nice seasonal trends and you can create spread combinations that are rather low risk and that further increases the popularity of grains. But now let's take a look at the chart. Uh, the records I open every week are probably those uh, three, uh, namely the prices, uh, uh, the commitments of traders data and the spreads, maybe sometimes even the seasonality. Uh, you can see that uh, I have uh, uh, classified uh, the grains into the major crops and minor crops. The major crops are mm, soybeans, corn and wheat, the, the most liquid and the largest uh, crops in the United States. And uh, the minor crops are commodities like oats or uh, rice, uh, canola and, and you know, like this. So let's take a look at the major crops I will start with uh, the simple price charts. Uh, these are the prices for the first uh, continuous contracts on corn, soybeans and uh, seabot soft red winter wheat. I use uh, this uh, template where I have uh, three small charts so they can fit to my screen. Uh, this is not maybe uh, the best way to read the charts because uh, they are quite narrow. But if you have a larger screen, you can make them, you know, more larger and more convenient. Or you can uh, flip your screen to the uh, portrait mode and then the charts uh, will look uh, much nicer. 
Moreover, there can be large differences uh, between the individual contracts, I mean individual expirations on grains. Not as much as uh, on net gas, but still uh, large enough to make a difference. And that's also uh, the reason why you have to be careful when you uh, use continuous contracts. But for the quick overview And also the longer term analysis, uh, these continuous contracts are fine. And that's the reason why I use this chart. And I use the same template also for the commitments of traders data. So once again, I have the cut position index for corn, soybean and seabot wheat. Uh, Once again, you can uh, use a different template or look uh, at uh, the commitments of traders data individually for each commodity. But uh, for the first quick overview of the changes in the markets, uh, I think uh, this is a good choice. And finally, uh, the spreads. The logic behind this chart is the same as I explained on on energy, uh, specifically uh, crude oil and net gas. So I mostly watch for divergences between the uh, spreads and the underlying. Uh, This chart is uh, particularly useful that I can compare the strength in the blue spreads across these three commodities. Uh, And also one important distinction compared to uh, the crude oil is that I always pick the spreads within a single crop. That's because the spreads across uh, different crops, I mean between the old crop and the new crop, are more volatile and are influenced by external factors. Basically, If you are interested uh, in the conditions of uh, the underlying physical markets, the spreads within a single crop are the way to go, at least in my opinion. And finally, I have the seasonality charts over here. This time I made uh, the charts slightly larger because uh, otherwise uh, it would be really hard to uh, read the charts. And I use simply the seasonal curves uh, because, once again, this is intended just to get a quick overview of the situation and maybe compare the seasonal trends uh, across uh, different uh, grains. Uh, so if I'm interested in, uh, in a more detailed analysis, I, will probably, I would probably stick to my uh, combination of uh, the seasonal curve and uh, statistics by month as you saw on uh, NetGas, I think. So uh, this is just to get a quick overview of the situation in grains. And now I will show you some additional charts uh, that are uh, unique to grains. I have a few charts uh, somewhere in here that are incredibly useful and I would even say critical for intermarket spread traders. Uh, These are the people who trade spreads between uh, different commodities. Uh, These uh, spreads are more risky. You need a much larger account to trade these spreads. But uh, these opportunities or these intermarket strategies can be mm, very successful and very profitable. And uh, these charts are simply the ratios between the uh, price uh, of corn and soybeans in this case. In other words, between the price of uh, individual grains. And I think uh, Their usefulness is pretty obvious because you can see the nice symmetry on the histogram and the mean reverting nature of uh, the ratio itself. That means there is probably some fundamental relationship between those two commodities. And that's true because corn and soybeans uh, often compete for the same acreage. And uh, even on the consumer side of the market, uh, they can substitute each other. uh, For example, in the feed industry for the animals or as a source of uh, protein. 
And these charts, uh, especially the histogram, are really great for visualizing this uh, fundamental relationship. For example, now, now we can see that the ratio between these uh, two commodities is uh, fairly common because uh, the last value is uh, in the red area. But uh, if uh, the ratio gets, uh, for example, too high uh, to the right side of uh, the green area, then corn would be quite overvalued compared to soybeans. And that would mean the consumers uh, would switch to soybeans, for example, in their feed process. And the farmers would grow more corn next year because... Uh, it's more expensive and they would make uh, a greater profit on corn. And that, in the end, would result in the normalization of the ratio and return back to normal. And this kind of behavior can be exploited by the intermarket spread traders because you can use a simple intermarket strategy when you short corn and, and, and buy soybeans to profit from the normalization of uh, that ratio. So I think the logic behind this chart and this analysis is pretty clear. Uh, I have the same data for other ratios. Uh, here I have the ratio between corn and uh, wheat. Once again, it works the same. And also the, the ratio between soybeans and uh, seabot wheat. So uh, these are critical charts for intermarket strategies and uh, personally I do not uh, watch them as closely I often take a look at them once a month but if you are an uh, intermarket spread trader you will probably follow them uh, every week but let's take a look at uh, some additional charts and I'm, of course I will stay in grains because uh, this group of uh, commodities is uh, really popular Maybe also these uh, two charts or these type of charts uh, can be useful to you because you can simply compare the price of some particular contract with uh, uh, some spread like this one because there is a fundamental uh, relationship between the spreads and the underlying and it can be really simple to visualize it on spread charts. But now let's take a look at uh, something different. All the charts I have shown you so far were dedicated to the analysis of uh, the commodities in general. But let's say you already have uh, an opinion about uh, the commodity as a whole and you are interested in detailed analysis of some specific opportunity. I will show you a few charts that I typically watch uh, when I'm doing uh, detailed analysis of uh, some specific opportunity. Like this one, uh, which is an intra-delivery spread on soybeans. So let's uh, open these charts. And I usually start with uh, the price of the underlying, but this time I always pick a specific contract, not the continuous contract that's assembled from many expirations over time. So here I have uh, the last contract from the old crop, but in this case, uh, I would personally pick a different one because uh, the spread is from the new crop. So I would uh, pick the November expiration, which by the way is uh, one of the legs in the spread. And I would perform the price action on uh, this chart, on this particular contract. I would also do the COT analysis, I mean the commitments of traders data, but this time just for soybeans uh, so that I can study uh, the chart in detail. For example, here we can see that the market uh, has been quite overbought uh, for some time. Uh, and finally, let's take a look at the spread itself. 
I have the seasonal uh, analysis first. Uh, it's simply the same combination of charts as I used elsewhere. So I have the seasonal curves on the top and the statistics by month on the bottom. And I usually hide the five year statistics. I would say the conclusion here is uh, pretty obvious. Uh, the spread is in a strong seasonal period uh, that lasts till the end of September. But uh, it's fair to say that the best month is already behind us because uh, it was the month of July uh, where the statistics are incredibly favorable for the spread. But overall, the trend can continue for some time. And by the way, I just realized that I skipped the uh, technical analysis of uh, the price of the spread itself. So I would do just the price chart of the spread and take a look at supports and resistances. But I think that's uh, fairly obvious and I will not delve into this uh, right now. Uh, the interesting thing, which is something uh, you have not yet seen in this video, is here. It's the detailed or short-term valuation analysis for this particular spread. This is uh, obviously the stacked seasonal chart, but the first thing uh, you might notice is that I do not use the prices of the spread itself, but rather I express the spread as a contango percentage. The contango is simply better for the valuation analysis uh, because the value of the spread uh, depends on the price of the underlying into some degree. Uh, and I think you know that because uh, when the underlying is uh, very expensive, the spreads uh, also uh, tend to be uh, more volatile or uh, wider and uh, so on. That's not important in the short term, but over the long term when the price of underlying can be a magnitude higher or lower, uh, that can make a difference. So the way to use uh, this analysis is very simple. Uh, I can hide the abnormal years like uh, the blue one and then I compare the current value uh, which is always the blue curve with the previous years at this time. So now I can see the spread is uh, pretty cheap because it's closer to the bottom of uh, the historical channel. And that means uh, that uh, it has still great uh, upside potential. As I said, I call this uh, detailed or maybe short-term valuation analysis because I'm comparing the current value just with uh, nine previous uh, years. But I can also do the long-term valuation analysis, which is this chart. I have once again the spread expressed as a uh, contango percentage, but this time I'm aggregating data across a long period of time. Uh, in this case, it's 20 years. So I have the continuous price uh, of the spread on the bottom subchart and the histogram of the same metric on the top subchart. Unlike the detailed analysis, I have uh, much more data on this chart and that's because uh, I'm not comparing the current value just with uh, 9 years but with 20 years of data and not just uh, in this part of the year but uh, over the whole year. The disadvantage is that uh, it is uh, slightly less relevant because I'm comparing the current value not just with uh, these few selected values but uh, uh, over uh, the whole year. Uh, but uh, uh, this is just intended for the long-term analysis and we can see that uh, the conclusion is uh, rather similar to the detailed analysis because, we, because you can see that the current value is uh, on the left uh, edge of the, right, uh, of the uh, red colored area, which means that the spread is entering uh, the 
left green area which is the which is the area of slight undervaluation so we can say that the spread is about to become slightly undervalued and there is still probably a decent uh, profit potential once again the histogram is very useful because uh, we can get this information in a second so that was uh, the example how i personally analyze a specific opportunity uh, you can check out uh, the charts or similar uh, types of charts also for other spreads or other opportunities and you will find out that they are uh, universally uh, helpful so that was all about uh, grains uh, let's take a look at uh, other uh, groups uh, and it will be um, rather quick because uh, um, I often use the same charts as you can see here for example the meat prices meat spreads and commitments of traders data so uh, it would be pointless to go through the same charts again but uh, maybe I can show you the hawk crash spread if you trade uh, lean hawks uh, either spreads or the underlying this chart is uh, incredibly useful to you uh, you can see that uh, I have the histogram of the hawk crash spread uh, on the top then I have uh, the price or the ratio itself uh, on the bottom subchart and I also have the price of uh, the underlying uh, hawks on the bottom Keep in mind that uh, the last subchart can be sometimes uh, less relevant because once again there are huge differences between individual expirations on hawks. So you can uh, switch to a specific contract if you wish and compare the uh, crash spread with the price of a specific contract. But for the quick overview I would say this is sufficient. I won't uh, go into details because that's uh, not the point of this video but I would say that uh, I would just say that this is a uh, critical uh, fundamental ratio for hawk breeders because it uh, uh, approximately shows their uh, their margins and uh, I think you would agree that uh, the profit margins are very important for the hawk breeders and therefore it can affect uh, the hawks market in a major way for example now you can see that the crush spread is really overvalued because it's above the 95th percentile it's to the right side of the green of the, of the right green area so it's overvalued and there is a pretty good chance we will see a, a meaner version in the hawk market uh, that would be great for bear spreads by the way so that's one of the ways uh, spread charts and the histogram can be useful uh, to spread traders and that's uh, probably all uh, i will tell you about uh, meats so let's move to the next group uh, which are metals I will show you, show you just a few charts because um, it doesn't make sense to uh, show you the prices or simple commitments of traders data charts again. So I will pick this one, uh, maybe this one, uh, this one, and this one. So let's, uh, yes, that's all. Let's open them up. And uh, here we go. Uh, this chart is uh, interesting because uh, it's a ratio between the price of gold and the euro fx futures the point is that uh, you can chart the price of some particular commodity in other currency than just the us dollar in this case uh, you're looking at uh, the gold priced in euros and that's uh, important because uh, mm, gold is an uh, international commodity and the european market is important for the global gold market so 
you can clearly see that uh, there are some resistances and supports on this chart and uh, uh, I think it's important to follow the price of gold not just uh, in US dollars but also in euros, uh, Japanese yen and maybe even some other currencies. And as you can see, it is very simple to do this on spread charts. The second chart is basically the distribution, the price distribution of gold in US dollars. I think this is something I, dis I already described uh, in other uh, chapter of uh, this tutorial. But uh, in this case, I'm using uh, the short term periods like the two years or one year. And I look at the clusters of the columns because they can help me identify the areas of supports and resistances. For example, if the price uh, moves lower, there is a, a good chance uh, they, it will react on the left tail of this distribution and maybe minervert back into uh, the cluster. Or if it breaks down, it's very likely it will spend some time on the left, uh, in the left uh, cluster of uh, columns. So this is a quick way to visualize important price levels and supports uh, or resistances. The last two charts are cross-market uh, analyses. The first one is simply the comparison of the price of gold uh, against the Swiss franc because uh, these two markets have a lot in common. Both of them are safe havens. That means uh, in times of uh, panic in the broad market, investors tend to uh, put their money into these safe havens like gold or Swiss franc. And you can clearly notice the correlation between these two charts. So I often uh, look for divergences or whether the price action on the Swiss franc confirms the price action on gold. And finally, the last chart is the fundamentally important silver-gold ratio. Uh, I often watch this ratio to get a clue about the strength of the precious metals market in general. Because when the market is strong, the silver tends to outperform gold because it's a smaller market. And right now, for example, you can see that it's... Uh, quite weak because the silver gold ratio broke down from this uh, consolidation and looks to be um, still rather weak and that means uh, the price of gold or the precious metals in general may uh, encounter some weakness in the short term and I would say that's uh, all I will tell you about the precious metals. Of course, you can create some other uh, cross-market ratios, like here you can see the palladium-platinum ratio or silver-palladium ratio, and uh, that can be useful uh, for intermarket strategies and so on. Uh, and now I will probably skip softs because all the charts would be quite similar to those I already shown you. And... Uh, maybe I will uh, give you a quick overview of the charts I use for the stock market or the volatility markets because despite our focus is definitely on commodities, the spread charts app can be very useful even for uh, investors in the equity markets or stock traders. So let's open a few charts. Uh, I don't know, maybe this one, this one. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, and that would be that would be all. So first of all, you can simply visualize the price of uh, the S and P five hundred futures using the continuous contract, and we have. Uh, the full history of data so um, this can be helpful if you are analyzing the long-term price section because uh, other platforms may have uh, just limited amount of data 
or you can take a look at the seasonal analysis for these equity indices. Uh, this is very popular, at least from what I see on Twitter. But keep in mind the seasonal uh, data or the seasonal statistics are less reliable on equity indices compared to the physical commodities. Of course, uh, you have to use uh, the specific contract, but if you are interested in a longer term analysis, you can simply uh, switch to the next expiration. And uh, here we go. Or you can add the uh, seasonality statistics by month, which I would say mm, can be also useful here. So this is how it looks like. I would say such a chart would be quite popular <laughs> on Twitter. Let's move to the next chart, which shows the course market ratios. Um, it is basically relative performance of technology stocks and small caps against the broad market. Once again, this is useful for investors uh, or strategies such as uh, tactical uh, asset allocation. So you can create whatever ratios you wish. And uh, as you can see, they can be quite helpful. Uh, the next chart is also a kind of a ratio. It's the continuous contango in VIX futures. And this is really helpful because you can compare the contango across different parts of the uh, VIX uh, term structure curve. And that's something uh, that's uh, critical for volatility traders and can be also helpful for uh, investors uh, into stocks because uh, you can simply uh, distinguish between the complacency and panic in the markets. For example, right now you can see there is a lot of uh, complacency because the contango is strong. Uh, the Contango on the near end of the curve is more volatile, but still can be useful to spot extremes in the uh, volatility markets. The following chart is interesting because I have not seen uh, anyone else using the similar combination of charts. Maybe other, other platforms are not capable of this because here I have the price of the S&P 500 futures compared to the uh, caught position index on VIX futures. So we are basically comparing the positioning in the VIX futures market to the broad uh, equity index. And this is a nice tool because uh, we can uh, clearly see that uh, when there is a panic in the markets, the curves tend to flip, which means that the speculators go uh, long, net long, uh, big futures, uh, or at least approach the zero level as we saw in uh, spring 2020. On the other hand, when uh, the positioning is really extreme, like we saw at the end of 2019, that means there's a lot of complacency, a lot of people are shorting uh, VIX futures or shorting volatility in general and <laughs> collecting pennies in the front of a steamroller and that usually ends badly. So uh, this chart is very interesting and I recommend you to watch it carefully if uh, you are an investor or trader in the equity markets. Of course, uh, this is a medium term uh, indicator, so it's not as useful for, you know, timing uh, the movements of the market in the short term. However, the next chart is a very short term indicator. It's basically uh, it's basically the comparison between the price of S&P 500 futures and the nearest VIX futures contract. Most of the time, there is a negative correlation between those two. But when the correlation turns positive, which means that uh, when the VIX futures contract starts to go higher together with uh, the S&P 500 futures, uh, that's the time to uh, become careful because uh, something like this uh, 
often happens before a correction in equities. The next chart is once again a cross market analysis. Uh, it's a simple comparison between the price of S&P 500 futures and Nikkei futures. So it compares the behavior of uh, the US and the Japanese stock market. Over the last few years, uh, majority of uh, the large corrections emerged from Asia. And that's the reason why it, uh, it is critical to pay attention to Japanese stocks. Right now we can see the divergence between the Japanese market and the US market. So this uh, chart tells us that maybe there will be a larger correction on US equities in the medium term. Once again, this is a medium term indicator. It takes some time for the divergence to develop, but ultimately, as we saw, for example, in spring 2020, uh, the US stock market eventually joined uh, the correction in Japanese equities because uh, uh, the divergence is very clear. Uh, the Japanese stocks were uh, moving slightly lower, not making high highs and creating lower lows while the US stock market was still surging higher. So that was a great example how this comparison can be useful to, uh, to traders and investors. And the next chart compares the behavior once again of uh, the S&P 500 futures uh, with the uh, currency pair and it's the currency pair between Australian dollar and Japanese yen. This is a well-known cyclically sensitive uh, currency pair. So uh, it usually correlates positively with the stock market. Right now, once again, we can see a negative correlation. So uh, this is definitely the time to be careful. In 2020, uh, I mean, the spring of 2020, there was once again a negative correlation. And that was uh, a great indication of uh, the problems that eventually uh, happened in the US stock market and led to the huge correction over uh, March 2020. And finally, the last chart I personally watch quite often uh, shows the rate sensitive indicators. The first chart is uh, the once again cyclically sensitive uh, copper gold ratio. And the bottom charts uh, are the rates themselves, uh, specifically the inverted uh, 30 year US treasuries. Uh, so uh, you can notice the, the correlation and uh, uh, usually when there is some divergence, I uh, tend to take a closer look at the markets, at the bond market and uh, the other uh, rate sensitive indicators like uh, some fundamental macroeconomic data and, and so on. So this is something uh, important for not just commodity traders, but also for uh, stock traders or investors, because uh, there is a well-known relationship uh, between these uh, uh, ratios or these indicators and uh, uh, value or growth stocks or the performance of value stocks compared to growth stocks and uh, so on. So that was the um, final example regarding the stock market. And I would, say, I would say that's all I wanted to show you because the other charts are just uh, different combinations of uh, the data or the charts you already saw. Here I have the commitments of data, commitments of traders data for all the major commodities and, and other markets like currencies and uh, equities. Uh, this is uh, useful to get a quick overview of uh, uh, the latest commitments of traders data. Uh, but that's probably all I would show you in this chapter. I hope uh, you 
will get some inspiration from my charts. But uh, as I told you at the beginning, uh, it's up to you to create your own workflow, your own templates and uh, save them into the watch list.